what's original about her is that she's uh, very much more a real person than a lot of the female superheroes who we're familiar with. She doesn't have any supernatural powers um, to speak of. I mean, she can't lift a bus, she can't fly like Superwoman. So I think that's what the major appeal of her is. She's a real woman and all of her abilities and relationships with people are founded on um, trust, morality and technique. Do you relate to that? Oh, definitely. She gets her job in a casino in Morocco and it's very much the very first time she's ever had to earn money in her life. She becomes very good at what she does and although she's a highly moralistic woman, uh, she's quite prepared to go to any lengths to get what she needs to protect her friends and the people around her and uh, herself. Uh, she's highly skilled in her martial arts and fighting yeah. as well. Now you've got quite a bit of um, fighting that goes on in the movie. Yes, I do, and I've never done anything like that before <laughs> in my life. But um, we had a wonderful trainer out here who's been showing me the moves, how to look convincing. Let's try it here. No, 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 no. From there. Try to, to punch her, block her, block, punch her, block. No, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Punch her. Bam! And now grab him. Yes. Now, this has been a real test. This entire film has tested every, every side of my um, acting ability, I think. How is the French club? Well, I'm going to go to the apple. That's just the English apple. It's been uh, such an honour to work with people in this way and I know we've had so little time to uh, do this. Uh, we've had 18 days filming, oh, which right. is an unbelievably short amount of time to shoot a film in. Um, so it's, it's congratulations to everybody involved that we've even managed to complete this project. Also, we've had the pleasure of filming relatively in chronological order, which for any actor is a joy because it means you can um, shape your character as you film the film and your journey is that much more coherent than if you were doing the last scenes of the film on your very first day of shooting and then trying to... Uh, piece things together like this crazy jigsaw as you go through six weeks of filming. Um, so in a way, uh, that problem has been um, a constructive one in the end. I think it's much more interesting shooting this way. Yeah, just because you see the rest of the place reflected in those wonderful, I mean, as long as you don't see the camera. But, in that, you know, as opposed to just this frosted glass. Yeah, so. And, well, the, the thing is, the, well, then they can go out that way. You know, to put the wood stairs out there. No, you're set up for that. <laughs> well, and you, yeah. And then you have the second camera can almost be there the whole day. Pacing in front, and you just do you do this, pan, and that picks up the last of the action where he lifts her up. Maybe they have four exchanges of dialogue, and they go off. The two trainers visit the movie. Make the view. No, we can just Wait, no, let's describe this. No, 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 I'm saying, aside from that, the, the goon drags Danielle and the Ieșiți afară de acolo, vă rog frumos, pentru ultima oară, nu sunt nervos, dar ieșiți afară. Boom, up against the bar. What's Miklos doing? And Miklos... I'm just... Exactly, now... Starting from where? 
Uh, well, I watched. Right? She's. I'm um, standing here. Yes. Maybe. I, I mean. Maybe I'm just. I don't know. I'm just. I think I'm a case. Tiger in a case. And then they come in. Ah. Uh, you. You. Find her. Move you asshole. You. They make a move. You kill them. And there. Uh, and then back to these guys. They're the nice. I have nothing to do with this. Yeah. That last half was great. Now, if there's any way for you to take a little more, you know. Okay, okay, so let's shoot one. Pictures up, smoke it in, pictures up, kill out. Retouch your touch up, picture. So let me let me get a nice little angle we like to be right. See? Okay. Good. Stand by. Ready. And action. You find it. Move. Come on. You keep them here. They breathe too loud. You shoot them. I have nothing to do with you. All right. Excellent. Yeah, we have to decide when this Yeah, I, I don't know about the expelling of bullets because we re 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 reworked that to where, you know, she gets shot just before she pushes them over, mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. Well, she could get shot in the struggle. Back After she gets shot. She could, like, yeah, expel yeah, exactly. the bullets. Right. Yeah, that also gives him time. If I'm going to be doing that right at the end, we're up on the mezzanine, it gives him time to make that one last comeback at me, at which point... Okay, for this shot, I'm well, jumping ahead because we're just about to shoot this. I'm well, sorry. Nice um, when that gun <coughs> you end up hitting okay, well, his arm, he's got the gun, you've got his arm. As a matter of fact, I don't know about the exploding bullets. I want that gun to be a deadly weapon. So you hit his arm between the two balcony things and go, and his, his, the gun drops. Yeah. And it's going to land in that roulette wheel, which I think is cool. Now, the issue is for this shot. He's falling now, he could be blocking the gun, but it might be kind of cool to see that gun in the roulette wheel, right next to him. I think it's better to keep the threat off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just so Otherwise, the whole point of that fight isn't to fight each other, it's to get, get the gun. Right, so sometimes... Yeah. Well, that's that's right. Oh, okay. the way. I mean, I think it's, if you keep the threat of the bullets in the gun, you're going to at least have some point on the fight, aren't you? Because yeah. everyone's going to try, both of them are going to try, the gun is going to be the first point of how the fight operates. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's what I kind of think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or else otherwise, it's just kind of a cat fight. Right. You know, and it's like if you have a yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and at least it gives it some kind of, well, what the, the audience, you can have some sense of what he is that this threat. And it's the only power he's had for virtually the entire movie is that gun. You take that gun away and she can take his ass. He meant to do it. What? The spinning rope. It's right here. Well, where he falls. Two thirds. I'm ready. How was it? Ready. All right. I don't see what I make, but Gaza is tomorrow. Is another. This is my problem, the last one. Don't and I don't see this. What is the in development? Now, roll camera. Motor. Motor. Speed. Speed. And action! And... Cut! Oh. What was that? I found my 
myself out of here. Help the boss. For the beginning, yeah? yeah? Okay, let's have a quick rehearsal. Yeah? yeah? Okay, stand by. Ooh. Then, can you stand up to me? You see me? Yeah. My feet are killing me. You see them? Knowing about Modesty Blaze and Peter O'Donnell and how long you've been fans. Well, I've been a fan of Modesty Blaze for, God, uh, God, it's probably about over 20 years now, actually. If not, yeah, definitely over 20 years. Uh, like sometime around in the, um, probably about mid 80s, you know, early to mid 80s, I started like, uh, you know, hearing about Modesty Blaze, and I've always was really, uh, actually a friend of mine named Al Harrell told me about uh, uh, the whole relationship. Told me about, uh, yeah, we were talking about spy, Things and kick-ass stories and comic books and characters and everything, and uh, and he brought up um, uh, Modesty Blaze and talked about like how cool she was and described the the character who's not in this movie but in the in the comic strips and in the novels of Willie Garvin and how their relationship was really special and all that stuff. And so I was like, oh, this sounds kind of interesting. He goes, but don't watch that first movie that was made on it, all right, the Joseph Lucy movie. Don't watch that movie, all right? That's not Modesty Blaze, all right? And so then um, the first uh, 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 comic strip I, I picked up uh, of Modesty Blaze in the early 80s, we, you know, where they took, uh, yeah, um, you know, he did, um, Peter O'Donnell did, like, novels, and then he did uh, comic, you know, comic strips, like, in a newspaper that were serialized every week. All right, and so then, you know, years later, they came out with all those different serialized comic strips as, as a graphic novel, basically. And so I started buying those. I started reading those and liked them so much that I started getting the novels, all right, and started reading little by little the different novels and stuff. It kind of totally fell in, 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 in love with the character. So, uh, and, and got really became a big aficionado, you know, of, uh, of uh, Modesty Blaze and stuff. So that's how it all, that's how it all started for me. And then were you also a fan, Scotty, or is this like some that sort of... Oh, gosh. Knowing Quentin and stuff. So then that's where I knew Modesty Blaze and, of course, in Pulp Fiction. Mm, yeah. John oh, yeah, Travolta. John Travolta's reading the no Modesty Blaze novel. Yeah. And, and so I was like, oh, okay, cool. And Quentin would go on and on. And, you know, of course, it just starts getting you excited. But it's like, oh, crud. And mm -hmm. I knew there were these graphic novels and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But so that was kind of like my little, like, oh, okay, I got to... A uh, mini education on modesty there a little bit, <laughs> and Connie too. Yeah, well, she like is cr my mom is crazy into Modesty Blaze. Absolutely, positively adores Modesty Blaze. Absolutely. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Now, now I feel complete. So I'm so into getting like. I just got a great book on. I think it's called Espionage in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's got all the you know Mike. Connor's spy uh, movies, well, you know, which is great. the yeah, girls yeah, and make them die, and, great movie. you know, yeah. Bulldog Drummond and, yeah, yeah, and the exactly, Deadlier yeah. Than the Male. Yeah, yeah, all the oh, Richard Johnson, yeah. I, yes, yeah, I, yeah. which is a terrific movie. Yeah, I really exactly. liked it. But I'm um, like, I, I just love having, like, I'm such a completist, you know. Mm -hmm. I got for every TV but now show, you've every done an espionage movie. I know, uh, I know. You're one of the most famous espionage characters out there. Oh, man, good grief. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Peter says in an interview that he was so touched that when he got the phone call mm -hmm. from your assistant, I don't know who it was, but someone called him to see if you could use Modesty Blade. Yeah, uh-huh. Right, uh-huh. 
was like at that moment he became the biggest fan. I guess you didn't have to do it. But oh no no! Oh, I'm a huge fan of Peter O'Donnell. All right, and you know, and and it was funny because I remember like the first uh, of the uh, um, comic strip things that I bought. All right, I had a big long interview with him talking about why like the movie doesn't work. All right, and how Joseph Lucy went and did his own thing. And when you read Peter O'Donnell's uh, either his novels of Modesty Blaze or, or the comic strips, there's such integrity to them. There's just like, you know, there's, there's things Modesty would do and there's things she wouldn't do. There's things Willie Garvin would do, there's things he wouldn't do. All right. And, you know, and, and it's never up for grabs. I mean, there's a complete, you know, if you could only wish TV shows had as much integrity as Peter O'Donnell had, you know, when he did all of his different stories. And so the idea is, it was just obvious that, like, you know, he was really burnt by the idea of ever training it into a movie or a TV show or anything because nobody's going to have the integrity he has for it. But all the fans have the same amount of integrity. So the minute you start changing anything, you know, it's like, ugh. All right, and, and look, and some things need to be changed in comic strips. But you know what? In Modesty Blaze, there doesn't need to be, all right? You know, they're just full on, they're, you know, they're, it's not like it's a, even though that when they do most comic strip movies, or comic book movies, they have, feel they have to add in all this stuff that, one, they don't need, but two, it is a comic book, so maybe, you know, a third dimension needs to be added to it a little bit. Right. But, but in the case of uh, Modesty Blaze, no, no, Peter Donald has, has written tons of novels on the character. There's yeah. no, they, they're, they're, you know, they're not stick figures. They are three, four dimensions to them. Exactly. Why did you want John's character, Vince, why did you want him carrying Modesty Blaze? Like, what? Mm -hmm. Was it just because it's homage to it, or? Oh, no, no, no. It was like, a, well, no, it was just the fact that uh, uh, um, uh, if I'm going to put a book in somebody's hand, I'm going to put a book that I've read, all right? You know, a book that I like and everything like that. And so I'm, I, I didn't spend that much thought on it, all right? It, I was, it, I wasn't, it wasn't meant to be, you know, ruminated on 20, 10 years later. <laughs> <laughs> right? But it's like, you know, no, you know, uh, I was reading, uh, I was reading some Modesty Blaze novels right around that time. If I'm not mistaken, I think the first Modesty Blaze novel, the, the, the one, one of the, the one that he was reading, I had bought in Amsterdam when I was writing the script. So that was like in my mind. So that's probably what made me write it down in, this, in, in, in the script. And then, uh, then I actually had the prop guys actually come up with a much better cover, all right, than the cover of the actual book. So they came up, they, they, I gave them some, some of the comic strips, and they did a really great blow up. They, I still have that cover, all right. I, I put it on the old cool. book, all right, because cool. it's really cool. Looking, yeah. Right? Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it, was, I mean, it wasn't like a gigantic thought process behind it. But like, no, I always liked, liked it. I thought, hey, that would be a cool book for Vincent to read. Oddly enough, it's funny though. I always have people like rereading like espionage or spy books for some reason. All right, uh, it's like uh, John Travolta's reading uh, Peter O'Donnell's Modesty Blaze, uh, and Jackie Brown. Uh, Robert Forster is reading Len Dayton's uh, Berlin Story. Len Dayton's the guy who wrote uh, Epicus File. And yeah, Pasta. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Michael. Yeah. Cut to ten years later. It's yeah. It's applicable because you're presenting. Yes, Modesty exactly. Blaze, and that's a how did you get involved in presenting that? And why him? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was funny because it was it was it was a cool situation because Miramax had had the project for a long time, and it's like a and it's a and it's a big movie, and I was one of the, the one of the producers on it, and it's a big movie, and and I'm kind of the reason it hasn't been made before now because they had this one version of the they had this one novel that they wanted to adapt it from, and my whole thing is like it's got to be right, que tus trailers or I can't be involved. In. So you know whenever like. They wanted to kind of go forward with it on this bigger movie, and it, and uh, but I thought it was too much compromised or wasn't correct enough about the the, the, uh, the book and everything. I'd say, okay, well you guys can do it, and I'll just back out. So see you guys later. All right, but I, you know, it's like I'm not even saying you're going to make a bad job of it, but it's different, too different. So I don't want to be involved in it and whatever. All right, and they were like, no, 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 no. All right, so thus I've kind of stopped a big movie from being made, unfortunately. All right, but then. What happened is they had the situation is they still want to make their big movie, but they had to make a Modesty Blaze movie. All right, before like they ran out, they had to show that they had a desire to make one as opposed to just talk about making one. Right, right. All right, and so they go, well, we're going to make a small one before we do a big one. All right, and they go, oh, okay, fine. All right, and then uh, so they go and they, they, uh, they commission a guy to write it, 
and then I get the script, and I read it, and it's like, it was pretty clever. Everything that they did, they worked out pretty good because it was like, oh, I go, hey, that's a neat idea. They didn't take one of the, they didn't take one of the, uh, the, the uh, 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 um, comic strips. They didn't take the novel. And they didn't deal with the whole thing of Willie Garvin, because if you deal with him, how are you going to deal with him later? And, and it's almost like that's the thing that almost stops the movie from getting made, because that's the thing I'm the most specific about, is the relationship between Modesty Blaze and Willie Garvin. And if that's not right, then it'll never be right. And so they got rid of it altogether and did like a, like a pre-episode. Right. Something that like, you know, Peter, ja you know, Peter, uh, not Jackson, P uh, Peter O'Donnell never really talked about, except for like, you know, sections in random stories about, you know, Modesty at 19. And as I'm reading, wow, this is a good idea as I'm reading the script. And we didn't know we were going to make that script, all right? It was just like, here's an idea to do a small one that's ma makeable, all right? And I'm really like, hey, this is a good idea. I, I don't know exactly what happened to Modesty at 19. Hey, this is a good idea. This is a neat little story. And then I started reading, and I go, hey, this is, like, genuinely good. This is really, really, really good. And... Um, so the film was all set up. It was all ready to be made in Romania. It was, it was a Romanian, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was all hooked up for to be made in Romania. It was ready to go. And, um, and so then I call Harvey Weinstein up. And this is like, this actually, this is a week before shooting, if not short of a week before shooting. It might actually be short of a week, all right? But it's a week before shooting. And uh, I call him up to tell him how much I like the script, that I think it's really good, all right? And I go, you know, Harvey, I mean, you just kind of wanted to, like, save your property, but you actually ended up having a really well-written well script. This is a neat, you know, uh, I even thought of Corman. I thought a little bit about how you've taken this big character, but you've, like, condensed it so it can more or less all take place in that one room. Right. More or less. Exactly. Right? And so you can still kind of deliver all the goods and all the action and all the fun, but in a much, like, smaller... Well, rock all night kind of way. Rock all night kind of way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I was like, you did a really good job, man. This is going to be really cool. All right. And then he goes... Uh, and then it trainers. wasn't even me. Visita mi All right, I'm not going to like say, oh, hey, by the way, I have a director a week before you start <laughs> shooting. <laughs> <laughs> I figured the director's suggestions that time had passed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And so it was Harvey Weinstein who said, you know, what about Scotty? What about Scotty to do the movie? Like, well, that's a great idea, but aren't you shooting in a week? I go, he can get his shit together, can he? I go, I, I think he can. Hama, 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 hama. Now, wait a minute. But it was really cool that, 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 that Harvey, th uh, um, you know, like, like, not only did it, like, you know, Harvey think of Scotty, he brought him up completely and utterly on his own. There wasn't a prompting, at least not for me anyway. There wasn't a prompting wow. about it or anything. And it just shows about how much both uh, Harvey and Bob really respected Scotty's work on, uh, um, on Dust Till Dawn 2, Texas Blood Money, but how much they really liked it. In fact, it's funny because like, I know, and I know this to be a case, that when it comes to dimension, when it comes to that year, do you, what, what, what year did uh, Texas Blood Money come out? Uh, 99. 99. When it comes to that year, that was Bob's favorite movie at Dimension. You know, he had movies that did this and did that, and it went straight to video and everything. But I, I personally know that that was Bob's favorite movie that Dimension did that year. When it comes to, like, Bob had to watch a movie that Dimension did, he'd watch Texas Blood Money. Wow. And cool. so they've always really, you know, wanted, you know, uh, uh, to work with Scotty on something else. It was something that was, like, you know, something that was good. You know, Bob even, like, said, you know, uh, he goes, well, I, I, you know, I could get Scotty, you know. You know, mimic two. You know, I could give Scotty, you know, uh, Children of the God, Children of the Corn five. And he goes, but I don't want to insult him. <laughs> well, <laughs> and so it's like you know, uh, um, yeah, but remember you saw Children of the Corn five. Like, hey, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that had Karen Black and William Wyndham in it. Now, wait a minute, Fred Williamson, I think. Was and you know, it. you know who actually the star of that is? Naomi Watts. <laughs> that's right. Oh, 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 her. <laughs> Oh, for crying out That's right. That was ridiculous. <laughs> Actually, when Bob met her for uh, 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 met her at some Hollywood party after uh, Mulholland Drive, he was like, "Wait a minute, 
She, she's in Children of the Corn 5. I might have a, a couple pictures. She might owe us a couple movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Check those contracts. Yeah. Absolutely. Follow man. that Oscar nomination with Children of the Corn 7. I'm sorry. <laughs> you signed. That's beautiful. God, I love this business. Oh, my. So, anyway, so it was uh, Harvey that brought it up for Scotty, all right? And, uh, and, um, and I wasn't even, and, and it was, and this also, this is like right, this is all happening right around the first week of Kill Bill. Just, just to put it in proper yeah. perspective. <laughs> so it's not like, oh, hey, maybe we can go to like, you know, Romania, you know, we're producing a movie. Maybe we can go there and have a good time and make sure Scotty's okay. None of that. Yeah, it was like, Scotty's got the job. Take off to Romania. See you later. <laughs> I've been tracking you for like weeks, trying to get you. To, we're finishing our pulp disc. Mm -hmm. You owed me something. You called me like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to Romania. What? What would you feel like? Something like this scurry, trying to get it together. Yeah, that phone call that you got all of a sudden, like in a week, you're gonna make a movie. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I didn't really, really know. I didn't until I got to Romania. I didn't even know who the director was or what was going on or why any any of this was really happening. Um, and. Um, I thought it was cool. I, I got a call from Lawrence mm -hmm. Bender and, um, hey, Scotty, you want to direct this movie? On, on Tuesday, I believe it was, Tuesday afternoon, and the script was messengered to me later that evening. And I read it, I thought, this is really awesome. I did think of Rock on that. And went, yeah, oh, <laughs> you I did think of it, yeah. I really yeah. did, because uh -huh. you showed that to me over at my house. It's one of my yeah. favorite. Oh. It's a Roger, one more great Roger Corman movie. And, and one set. <laughs> one set, ingeniously done with flashbacks and yeah. all this really cool stuff. And I went, oh my God. And I said, oh, this is the greatest, coolest movie. And like you said, mm -hmm. characters with integrity. Modesty is the total one of my favorite all-time, my favorite novel and one of my favorite all-time movies is To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. If I could be 1% of Atticus Finch, oh boy, I can't even get there. <laughs> but I mean, if I could get there, oh, please let it be. But to have a character with that multi-layered, like fourth dimensional yeah. character. Um, and I, I read the script and this one line really stood out, pretty much says everything about the whole movie of like, um, the 10-year-old modesty stole, took something that didn't belong to her mm -hmm. and her kind of uh, mentor this Obi-Wan Kenobi type character, Lob, uh, says, hey, what are you doing there? You're not supposed to be doing that. She's like, he goes, there is a line. And she goes, how will I know what the line is? He goes, you'll spend the rest of your life figuring that one out. And you're like, that is a really good line. And I'm like, right, oh, what a great one. Too, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, what, I mean that's a line for, that's for everyone. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was just incredibly well written by Janet, yeah. uh, Scott, and Lee uh -huh. Batchelor. And they did a terrific job. And, uh, you did know, you work with them I, during the course of the movie and everything? I didn't. There was one last like quick draft mm -hmm. as I was off on the plane uh, on the yeah, weekend. Yeah, uh -huh. But it was absolutely crazy. So I went, oh, yeah, 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 I'll do it. I'm so proud to be a part of this. This is wonderful. And next thing you know, I'm getting my passport the next day. <laughs> I'm like, i got to get my passport re redone. You know? And all of this stuff. And I'm reading over the script and trying to attempt a, a shot list right yeah, on uh -huh. the plane. And then I think we're shooting on Tuesday. And so like, yes, yeah, so you got called on Tuesday, and the next Tuesday you're shooting. Yeah. Right, exactly. Now Ted Nicolau, who was the original director, then got kicked upstairs to my boss to be my boss, and he was the sweetest guy. He'd done quite a few uh, Charlie Band pictures, like the Subspecies movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And he had, was a sound guy in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original. Oh, really? So he just really had a great history. And at first, it, T Ted was just absolutely instrumental in getting everything together and, and, and taking me under his wings, so to speak. There was no adversarial anything there. He was just wonderful. It was mm -hmm. absolutely terrific. And Michelle C. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, they, it was really a harmonious, wonderful thing that could have been very, very extremely awkward. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they weren't sure. And I'm like, well, who, who am I replacing and why? Well, here's the, here's the kind of what's going on. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Hey, you know, Here's the thing, though. It's funny because, I mean, it's great to hear this because part of the thing is, I mean, it was weird. The way you got the job, because it was all set to start shooting in a week with another guy. Right. It was literally, Harvey said, what about we get Scotty? <laughs> all right. And as much as I wanted you to do it, I was like, are we screwing this other guy? <laughs> You know, uh, and that's what was really cool because essentially, mm -hmm. they, he just went, "Okay, now I'm now I'm producer." Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. 
all right, Scotty, hurry up. Get that in. I'm like, nah. Yeah. No, he wasn't doing that at all. No, but he, he, he's, got the, he's the guy with the juice in Romania, right? Yeah. Oh, yes, he's the one that started the whole movie-making process over there yeah. right after the overthrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, God, there was like a Ted Nicolau wall in the studio. I don't know, it was Vlad's <laughs> place or whatever. It's just, a, you know, Ted's a big name and, and this Ted block Nicolau. letters. I know, it's really cool. <laughs> but no, he was terrific, and he would get us shots, and he just got everything. It was, it was really a harmonious and a really wonderful working experience so uh, it seemed like okay that position got reshuffled mm -hmm. you know okay so he was like, yeah he was like he was like i'm here to make the movie oh yeah. yes and he was a total team player and uh -huh. really is the greatest guy so i just i really lucked out on every conceivable level with michelle and and, and everything and getting everything yeah. we needed and the, the short 18 days right yeah <laughs> but it was great so you know. We, we got the shoot, like 18 days? Yes, 18 days. No, Did no. you have any reshoots or anything? Nothing. No reshoots, no additions. That was it. So at the end of the, on the 18th day, that's it. Boom. Yeah, exactly. The curtain, like, <laughs> But you know what I mean? But that actually, to give you some confidence also, as so, uh, so far as, like, look, Miramax is actually quick to reshoot. <laughs> if they thought the movie wasn't any good, you'd be reshooting it, all right? You know, they would like, you know, they could, they, they have been known to spend as much on reshoots as they spent on the original shoot, all right, of some movies. Am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, or more. No, I definitely take that as a compliment, but I'd like kick you out. I'm like, oh, if we just had that one shot. You but know, I mean, actually, I the fact. A roulette wheel POV. Oh, yeah. I wanted that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. cool rigging. Oh, man. But, but I mean, what but, you know, but the fact, you know, but the fact that after 18 days and they look at the moon, they go, okay, here we go. <laughs> well, I mean, and, to, and it's one thing to go, okay, Scotty, uh, you got four days prep, do it in 18 days, and then to shoot it on the back lot at Universal. Yeah, yeah. But to go to Romania, where most of these people did not speak English or at best 20% English. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Again, Ted Nicolau, it's like, oh, okay, here. Uh, you know, he acted as the mediator, and, and he knew everybody, and, and it was just all right there. It was really, uh, I mean, good Lord, I mean. You were totally crewed up. Like, they, these people now, walked it, in, and you had no choice. Uh, absolutely. It's, I don't like that wall. This casino sucks. Let's go over here. Yeah, right. No, yeah, no, yeah, no, this is it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll, no, no, I'll say. No, you're walking up. You're accepting a set that's already made. Right, right. Casting already done. You know, I'll, I'll like go, okay, can we get some glass for this table so I can do some reflection shots here? And I need to, to move the table out and to do a drawer POV. You know, yeah, yeah. stuff like that, which was they happened in a second. It was, yeah. it was great. So. But, as far, you know, but as far as costumes, as far as all the prep shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was all there. It was wonderful. It was yeah, really great. Yeah, but it was great. already done, too, yeah. at the same time. Absolutely. So you're like, oh, totally cool. So I was really. And actually, wonderful. it's kind of interesting you working back with Ted Nikolai. Yeah. All right. Is because you started at Empire. That's right. You were the last. That's right. You were, last. Were you were one of the. Were you the last or one of the last feature films at Empire? Uh, Charlie yeah. Band did it. Yeah. Then then that then he took to to Paramount for yeah. the Paramount deal. Yeah. Exactly. Me and uh, you were the. But you J.F. Lawton or what's his name? Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. that guy. Wrote yeah. Yeah. Free uh, woman. Um, it was like uh, avocado women or yeah. Yeah, and Pir Pir piranha women, the yeah, avocado yeah, jungle of death, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, right, yeah. and Do Doctor Alien. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, those so. were the last three, right? Yeah. Those are the last official three. Yeah. Um, That's right. Empire films. Uh, Scotty's Intruder, his first film, with my producer uh, Lawrence Bender, his first film, and uh, Doctor Alien and Avocado Women. I mean, Piranha, Piranha Women, women in the, in the Avocado, avocado yeah. Jungle. Love death. And and Charlie <laughs> apparently the, the original titles were uh, for Intruder was Night Crew, mm -hmm. the final checkout, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> Doctor Alien was I was a teenage sex mutant, and I think. Uh, Piranha Women was Avocado Women. I was yeah, so confused. Oh, was. The titles were up. changed yeah. for some peculiar <laughs> reason. I'm not sure exactly. I'm so confused. They messed up Avocado Women. That was better I know, I know. <laughs> Piranha Women. So that was that. That's interesting. Yeah, exactly. And then you're back when, back, you know, years later, you work with Technical Eye again? Exactly, yeah. Pretty wacky. What was it like working with producers besides had there were all these Michael Barrow, all these people who have been involved with modesty for years. The that was, and, and they were very, like, you know, religious about, you know, Modesty Blaze and her whole... Um, I, th I thought it was great. I think um, Ted and Michelle C. and myself had a really great, you know, if we're, we were working, everything was great. If, if, like, you know, I did something, they're like, hey, wait a minute. I'm like, oh, okay, let's do another take that, you know, you guys like or whatever the case may be. But I kind of like it this way. No, nothing big, but it was a wonderful unit that really helped get this thing done on time and on budget and everything like that. And then when um, the Barrel Brothers came in there, 
I thought it was really cool. I think that Michelle and maybe Ted were kind of like, hey, wait a minute. We were kind of out of sync here a little bit. But I thought it was, I thought it was cool. They had some pretty cool ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think they were just really excited to see, hey, this it's movie's happening. It's happening. It's this happening. movie's getting made. And they seem to, you know, I, um, God. Well, when I talked to them, they knew a lot about Modesty Blaze. I mean, they've yeah. been, like, they've been sweating over it for a long time. Exactly. And they had, the, you know, th their video camera and were doing a making of and everything. But I think, ultimately, I think everything just fell into sync. And mm -hmm. uh, at least from my perspective, yeah. everything was really cool. It wasn't like, you know. The production got Visita slowed down in any, any way. We certainly had a certain groove that we were, you know, vibing with. And, um, but I think it was pretty cool. I don't know. Well, they're all very proud now. I mean, it's like they're all happy that Peter loves the movie. I mean, he's the heart. Yeah, he he's the hardest critic to please when it comes to Modesty Blaze. All right, because he's just you know he's almost inclined to you know not like anything because of that integrity. The minute it blows the integrity, it blows it. So knowing he likes your movie, how, I mean, how does that make you feel? Oh, man, like a million bucks. I mean, you always you're always nervous. You don't know. Mm -hmm. You well, you, really couldn't, you, couldn't get a tough, you couldn't get a tougher critic than the guy who spent 38 years. Well, and not only that, you know. And had um, been so disappointed. Well, exactly, and he had some notes on the film, you know, in terms of, oh, don't have, don't have uh, you know, this character say that line or maybe trim that line out and stuff, which, you know, I just on a very creative level totally agreed with. Did, yeah, uh, did cool. you like to, did you, did you take that stuff, you know, when he wrote that stuff? Oh, know? yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. And everybody was in agreement. Harvey, mm -hmm. everybody went, oh, mm -hmm. hey, that's pretty, pretty cool. I'm like, <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Because he was, again, it was kind of, you know, with kid gloves from what I was hearing from up above. You know? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh, heck, you know. But uh, and I just don't know what went through his head with the 66 version, which is really fun. It's yeah. not surprising. It, 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 on its own, yeah, taken no, away no, from. No, 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 that's the thing. That, you know, that's, that's the thing about it. It's like, if, here's, the, here's the bottom line. If you're a Joseph Lucy fan, you really like Modesty Bryce. Right, right. If you like. 60s wild extravaganza kind of. It's like that one movie, the thing. original Modesty Blaze, is really yeah. Michael Myers' template uh -huh, for the yeah. Austin oh. Powers oh, movie. Yeah, yeah. I don't think any one movie has as much mm -hmm. yeah, of, a, of that. Maybe that's like, you know, I mean, you know, if you're just stuff. a Lucy fan, you love it. If you like that kind of wild. Um, uh, uh, what's new, Pussycat, Casino Royale kind of exactly. 60s thing. All right, a little bit more artistry, then you'll like Modesty Blaze. But if you uh, that movie, but if you if you like the book or you like the comic strips, then it just seems like you know it, it, it's it's worse than Batman. It's just sacrilege. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's like sacrilege. Why, why are you taking? The, yeah, yeah. You know, dance numbers, you know. I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of all the. <laughs> no, wait a minute. But it's interesting. Like, but for instance, like, what you might call it, um, uh, 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 Paul Thomas Anderson's original poster, which is on the laser disc for uh, uh, the Criterion version of Boogie Nights, is based on the Modesty Blaze poster. Ah. Now, not the poster that was at the theaters. He couldn't get his poster, but like the cartoon drawing of Dirt Diggler with everyone all ah. around him and everything. All right, that's on the, the, the Criterion Laser Disc. Oh, cool. It, you know, it's taken from the Modesty Blaze poster. Oh, cool. Paul always liked that poster. Oh, man. Very cool. <laughs> so, a lot of people think of you know, Modesty, tons and tons of action, similar to James Bond, but uh, Peter's like, she's not like James Bond. She's mm -hmm. completely different. I mean, do you mm -hmm. see her completely different? Oh, yeah. I. I, I could see why people have that comparison since she was created in 1963. Yeah. And uh, the first G Dr. No came out in 1962, and Ian Fleming was writing the Bond films before that. Yeah. She kind of going, okay, she's, she's a female, she's a spy, but I guess that's weird. I guess maybe you can make that jump. But no, I think it's just another character who happens to be feminine, female, mm -hmm. and she's a spy. I don't necessarily equate big, spectacular, high-budget action to that. I mean, look, you had um, The Man from U.N.C.L.E. Yeah. And you had, uh, then you had Honey West. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, or The Visita Avengers. Yeah. Although you did have Emma Peel did kind of kick some ass, but yeah, yeah. Modesty kicks ass when she yeah. needs to. Yeah, but I mean, one of the biggest differences is, like, you know, James Bond is an agent working for the British Secret Service, and he's sent on assignments. Modesty. Yeah, Modesty, like, ran, like, the greatest smuggling network in, in the world. Exactly. All right? And and then retired, all right. You know, so it's like you know, so she was a criminal, 
all right, and criminal, all right. She was a criminal, and then she uh, um, quit it, and it's just like just living high in the hog right. on all of her her riches and everything. And so uh, 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 when I f can't remember, uh, but when the uh, the 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 British Secret Service guy comes to her to, uh, with an assignment. It's, it's purely on an assignment by assignment basis. It's like she does a job, her and Willie Garvin will do a job, unless it's personal, will do a job just for the fun of it. Just because they got nothing to do. All right, right they're right. bored. All right, so okay, well, let's, we'll do this. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting, Peter said, I mean, she was a pretty outstanding, outspoken, mm -hmm. You know, liberated woman before women's lib, before yeah. women really looked at, like, oh, we could be, you know, yeah. uh -huh. out there. I mean, is that, how cool is that? Oh, no, that's definitely cool. Man. Well, that's why, that, that's why I love Get Smart, and that's why I love 99. That's why I loved Honey West and mm -hmm. The Avengers. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, I mean, coming from the TV world, and you go, that is so cool. Or That Girl, for example. I mean, the heck with Mary Tyler Moore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That Girl had her beat by five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh -huh. that's just a big deal to have, at that point in 1965, t American television world, mm -hmm. a single yeah. chick going out and doing it at age you know, 22. You should be married and having children. Yeah, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, they, uh -huh. uh, so that was a real big deal. And, um, so her I think and let that girl her father work in the restaurant. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Wait, the best one though. The best one Blue is when Danny Thomas yeah. was on with Marlo yeah, Thomas, yeah, uh -huh. and he was dressed as a priest, and he walks by and she goes, "Hello, father." <laughs> That's the greatest gag. I want to steal. Like, what? A, that was my favorite. But I, enough of that girl. Um, but but that was. I remember uh, that. Remember that one? Well, the entire Thomas family was on That's that episode. Right. Like the sister and oh, the brother. Oh my God! Yeah, I remember right, yeah. that scene. And then they said oh, it in Danny God. Thomas, and then it was the last second. <laughs> yeah, it was the end gag. That was really. Ah man, nah, that's a teleplay for you. That was a great show, but that was that was really cool. So I I thought that was great and incredibly liberating. I thought it was awesome. It seems like too in terms of of the whole European look on that was just a lot more, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I well, mean Donna Reed, who's that, and what show is that? Mm -hmm. Ozzy and Harriet, and you know that whole convention. Mm -hmm. um, although even Lucy went it alone after yeah, they, yeah. she split up with Desi. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, she still had kids and still was kind of a domesticated thing. But even to that was 1961, 62. Well, you can make, a case can be made that like you know Lucy's whole comedy was the fact that in I Love Lucy or the Lucy show is she was always like drawing outside the lines. There was like the thing of comedy because she just wouldn't just be the housewife. She wouldn't just be the right. Mom. She wanted to be the housewife star. Yeah, she wanted exactly. To yeah, do what Ricky was doing, but yeah. yeah. So that's always interesting in in that. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that's a great, a very cool thing. But it was definitely uh, mm -hmm. ahead of its time, which is great. My favorite of the comic strip stories of Monty Blaze is one where. Um, uh, uh, the bad guys have captured Willie Garvin. All right, and what they 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 they've kidnapped him and they've captured him and they're giving him these drugs that are turning him into like a pat of butter. I mean, he's, he's you know he's you know he's seeing pink elephants and it's this kind of like it, it's like a it's like LSD, but like you are guaranteed to have the worst trip ever. <laughs> kind of LSD. <laughs> All right, there's no fun about it. And. If they keep giving him this drug in the course of a week, he will be completely insane. He will lose all of his brain cells. All right, right now he's just like freaking out and crazy and everything like that. And they go, and so the way that they tell Modesty that they have him, that they're going to institute their whole plan, is there's a knock on her door. She opens the door, and there's a woman there with a bun, her head in a bun, and glasses, and she's got a little case with her. And she goes, uh, uh, yes, Miss Plays, I'm here to see you, and uh, oh, who are you? Well, I think you will talk to me because it concerns your friend Willie Garvin's life. Okay, come on in. The woman comes in. She, she has a screen with her. She, sets, she opens the screen, has a little 16 millimeter projector, puts a film on, oh, reels it up, cool. and shows it. And in it, you see this 60 millimeter footage of Willie Garvin, like, you know, freaking out and everything. And the woman's describe, describing it as they're watching it, you know. You know, right now, he's simply, you know, he's going insane and everything. But if, he, uh, if I were to, uh, we were to stop administering the drugs in a week's time, he would be fine, all right? But if we keep administering the drugs, by the end of a whole week, after being 24 hours into this drug, he will be completely and utterly insane. His brain will be worth nothing. Now... In order for you to stop this, you have to do a job for us. So they wanted to rob something. And then we will 
you know, not kill Willie Garb. And then Monsi goes, well, okay, um, okay, what's going to stop me, okay, now that you've shown me all this and told me all this, what's going to stop me from killing you? <laughs> yes. Right now. She goes, huh, well, you can't do that. Because as you, uh, if you look outside, you'll see there's a car out there. Outside that car, inside that car are two men. All right, if I don't come walking out of here, all right, you know, in the next 10 minutes, all right, they will call up and Willie Garvin will be murdered. My eyes goes, okay, I got it. And then kills the woman, snaps her neck. All right, and then <coughs> it becomes the whole thing of her calling up the British Secret Service and saying, okay, look, here's what's going on here. All right, in the next 10 minutes, I need a guy, I need a stunt driver out in that car. All right, I'm going to be dressed like this woman I just killed. I'm going to walk outside. I need a car to hit me. <laughs> All right, I need you to, and I need a British Secret Service with an ambulance right there. Come and whisk me away. <laughs> All right, you know, the whole thing is that she's going to dress up like the woman, walk outside, be hit by the car. Oh, All right, man. The, uh, be laying on the street, an ambulance comes by immediately, yeah, picks her up, takes <laughs> her to the hospital. <laughs> While she's on the way to the hospital, all right, now she's going to go get Willie. Yes. All right, but it looks like just like the woman who went there with the 16 camera got hit by a car. It was great. All right, you know, the fact, like, the bullshit on that. Boom, she kills a woman right away. Exactly. And then like, figures out a way to, like, work it out. And, like, to me, that's modesty. That's, like, that's my, one of my favorite stories of modesty yeah, is that, that whole scenario right there come up with something so crappy. Uh, yeah, Lighting right there. It's got to be right there, yeah. Right. Yeah, and she's talking this. <laughs> they bring the stunt driver in before he hits her. This all happens. got to happen in 10 minutes. All right. They bring the stunt driver out to the room, and she goes, okay, don't try to hit me. Hit me. I'll get out of the way of the car. You hit me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. It's, it's got to be nice. convincing. <laughs> Any favorite stuff. production stories? Anything cool happen on set? What's the, what's, what's, what's the most fun thing you tell us about? Yeah, during those 18 days. <laughs> 18 days. <laughs> yeah, that was 18 days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh. On the 16th, uh, day. <laughs> it, it, it really went by pretty fast. Um, <laughs> oh, no shit. I know, huh? Um, and just the culture shock of being in a country without warning labels. You're like, oh, wait a minute now. <laughs> yeah, I'm always yelling about, everything's over-regulated in America. Everything you cut to, like, Romania. Look out, the house is flying. <laughs> You're like, oh, regulation, please, oh, please, I want A's and B's and C's in the restaurant windows. Oh, I was only kidding. And so aside from that aspect, where you're like, oh, oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that's everywhere you go. I couldn't imagine having children there. Oh my God! You're walking down the street. There's a giant spike. Like, ah! oh, well, I think there's a manhole, open manhole. Look out! And you're like, oh my, oh my God! How did the, how we are the most spoiled people on the planet? Oh my God! And I'm glad. That means I keep my eyes and I won't like die. You walk down the street, there's a big thing. spike. Or, right? I got I, it. There's like 80 dogs over there. I'm like, haven't you heard of that? Animal shelter. Come on, we must, you know, spay and neuter the dogs. Oh my God. Aside from that, um, no, it was really one of the smoothest productions ever. Harvey came down on the set. Mm -hmm. I, 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 oh, God, and he, he just absolutely, it's like Brando coming on the set because he's got this aura about him. You're like, oh, why did we got to put him in as like a casino guy? But he wasn't about to have any of that. <laughs> that was really wonderful. I'm like, oh, I thought I'd just be here in Romania. Nobody's going to come. You know, yeah, yeah. Nobody's uh, going to yeah. bother. It would let us make our little movie and stuff, and there's Harvey right there. It was really cool. He's very complimentary. He's, oh, he's like, hey, that's a nice shot on there. Uh, yeah, it's a great Harvey story, actually. So we're doing like, well, actually, it was the end shot. We had this like crazy camera thing that, that mm -hmm. spins and stuff like that, like the roulette wheel to show one of the characters had um, died. And Harvey goes, that's a great shot. I, Is that how you're ending the movie? I go, yeah, just like in the script. He's like, mm-hmm. He goes, you know, you should end with modesty. You know, after all, the name of the movie is My Name is Modest, and you walked away, and here I'm going, oh, God, if we only had a second unit, can we get another camera, and just one more extra day, you know, we're trying just more time, you know, the, 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 the low budget, that, you know, angst that everybody has trying to make one of these movies on time and on budget, and I just went to Ted and Michelle, I'm like, Harvey wants us to end on, on, on modesty, and I think it's a great idea, and, you know, when Harvey says something, you listen because it's a great idea, like I say. Mm -hmm. you, you, it's like you two guys and mm -hmm. Bob, mm -hmm. you, they have the most insane instincts. It's like, again, it's like, it's crazy. 
And he was right, and we came up with something very quickly, but I thought it was pretty effective. That is, ends up in the movie, and you're like, it's always right, mm. you know? And we did it so that it, we didn't end up going over budget, but yeah. it, it just, that working with people like that really makes you rise to the occasion and go, okay, this isn't just kind of. Well, he's not saying like, "Oh, you're wrong." He's like, well, "You know, couldn't be no, good." No, but it yeah, was right. So it was it's web spinning, yeah. You, yes, exactly. <laughs> and, you go, and come up with something that's cool, but you know, don't take four days to do it for God's sake. You know, it's got to be. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly, you, yeah. you're quick on your feet. Let's do it. Yeah. And I'm like, "Oh man!" So that was really just a really crowning cool achievement mm -hmm. and stuff. And uh, my buddy Raymond Cruz is in the film, and uh, you played Garcia. Mm -hmm. And um, he's cast for you. Yes, and that was Michelle C. And they like, can you get your your buddy Raymond Cruz? And he just read the script on the way over. He didn't know because he was in you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. From Dust of Dawn, you know, Raymond. He's terrific. <laughs> he's funny, and uh, so that was really kind of nice. And, and so we had him, and um, I think we had you know Eugenia Ewan, mm -hmm. who was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that was it in terms well, of. Yeah, she's a do yeah, and like uh, uh, Eugenia Ewan is the uh, the daughter of Shang Pei Pei. Yes, I, a Crouching you know, Tiger. Yeah, the yeah, she's in Crouching Tiger, and she's you know. One of the big stars mm -hmm. of uh, the early days of uh, 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 Shaw Brothers. Yes. Uh, she was. Uh, she's the. She's the star of uh, Come Drink with Me, King Hughes film. Come Drink with Me. She's the star of uh, uh, Shang Shay's uh, uh, Golden uh, Golden Swallow. All right. Also, that's got a great British title: The Girl with the Thunderbolt Kick. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh. but yeah, yeah, Ginny, I mean, it's, yeah, she's like, she's royalty. She's Shing Pei Pei's daughter. Well, it was cool. And then, of course, our stars, Alexander Stadden, who's been mm. in some Mike Figgis films. She was just absolutely incredible. And Nikolai Koster Waldau, mm -hmm. who was. Uh, he was terrific. Terrific. And I think it was so funny, too, because when we were doing the ADR for this movie, I'm like, yeah, Nikolai, remember we had to do like 14 pages, 17 pages. Like yeah. the actors remember, like we had to do 17 right, pages yeah. of one day with two AB camera. Uh -huh. Oh, my God. But thank God. They're crackerjack right yeah, there, yeah, so you're yeah. like, oh my god, you know, you're like, man, oh man. Um, but uh, no, nice, really cool, smooth production. Everybody on the Romanian side was really great. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Vivi, our, our director of photography, was really good. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's ugly. No, no. And I like, would always have to try and like, no, I want this cool transition. Go right up to the sun. But it wipes it out. I go, I know. And then I can burn into Modesty's face. And, uh -huh. Oh, no. I'm like, just do one for me. Come on, Vivi. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Because he was uh, this uh, incredible professor of, of cinematography, I guess, uh -huh. at some university over there. And He's like kind of like, I'm the godfather of yeah, you know, yeah. cinematography in Romania. So he was pretty really cool. But I thought he did a terrific job too. Yeah. So you know, gosh. Well, I mean, it's 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 completely. I mean, this whole experience has completely been like. Um, me and Scotty's dream of what it must have been like working for Corman, you know, because it's been a dream of ours, that idea, yeah. all right? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we don't live in that world, but we wish we did, all right? And, um, and I can imagine you reading the script on, you know, reading the script and then getting on an airplane. And because I remember when I got sent the script and everything, and it was like, okay, everything's been reduced. It's going to be low budget. It's going to be this. And then we're going to knock it off in 18 days and everything. And here's the script. Okay. All right. So we're gonna, Hey, this is pretty good. <laughs> I know, I know. And you can do this in 18 days, yes, all right? Exactly. But this exactly. is good. I like I like the bad guy character in this. He's good. I like Modesty's character in this. He's, he's good. It's like what in the heck? It's like like it's like modest in like you know Modesty Blaze, but it's like yeah, but it's modest in the best way. Right. Exactly. And how you develop Gar, which you've just done really, but uh, you know that you've spent 15 years on Garth and then. Yes, you, were well, you know, my, my experience in comic strips started when I was first went out to work at 17. Yes. I was working on the juveniles and had to get out ideas for this, that and the other. 17 you started? Yeah. Oh, so young. What, that was, what was then called the Amalgamated Press. Uh, that was the biggest publishing house in the world. Then, uh, the whole of the sixth floor in Fleetway House was comics. And uh, used to, they used, we used to publish 22 comics a week, Penny Blacks and Tuppence Coloured. Yeah. Yes, I started there. My father was a crime reporter, oh, and, yes. and my brother was uh, on the news of the world. He's three, he was three years older than me, and I thought I'd go on to newspapers. Just as well I didn't, I'd have made a terrible reporter. But the old man hawked me round the various editors he knew, saying, you know, offering all of them first ch first option on this 
Reverend Vlad and they all chose to refuse. <laughs> and then I ended up, he got a friend in, uh, in magazine publishing and I ended up going on the juvenile department of the Amalgamated Press which published, as I say, 22 comics a week. And I thought that this thing for kids was far beneath my dignity. But I soon got straightened out on that because it is very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, I mean, almost my first day, a chap came in and said, look, we're running this story, Monarch of the Wild, it's about a horse, it's a Western thing. It's about a horse who's got a big key in his, his mane. And this is the key to some treasure somewhere or other. And these two cowboys are trying to catch the horse. Now, you couldn't have gunfires, anything like that for the children. Mm -hmm. You had to think of things that you could do with this situation. And he dumped this on my desk and said, work out a couple of weeks of that. So that was the first, my first scripting I did. And uh, after that, I greatly chastened. I settled down to learn the trade. Um, when the war came, over, I was in the Territorial Army and I was 19, so I went off to have a bit of a war and I came back six years, eight months later and uh, went freelance and there were, you know, some one or two, it was rather difficult because paper was short after the war, so it was rather difficult to break in, but I was taken on by one of the editors who, who ran Film Fun and he, he was fed up with uh, the writing he'd been getting for two stories that he ran every week. One was a detective story, Jack Keane and his boy assistant, Bob Trotter, and the other was, uh, not, it was a series, I mean different characters every week, it just had to be a 3,000 word story uh, uh, with a lot of adventure in it. And uh, I was paid two guineas a thousand. No, sorry. Yes, that's right. Two guineas a thousand. A thousand words. A thousand words. Two guineas a thousand words. They were paid in guineas in those days. In guineas. Yes. <laughs> um, Gosh. Still. And but this this editor, I had I used to go in on a uh, Thursday morning, and I got to, had to give him an idea for the detective story and the drama story brief outline. Now he was a betting man and he was always reading his betting paper when I arrived and uh, I'd sit there and I'd re reel out this synopsis of the story and he'd say okay go and do it. So I'd, I went to do it and I'd write one in the rest of Thursday and the other on the Friday and I'd deliver them at four o'clock on the Friday because I had an office in Fleet Street so I was on the spot. And uh, I, I did this for about or four years in fact, Qu quite regular. Uh, there came a time when I was you know, really rather worried about something. My wife was having a, another baby and there were problems and I, I hadn't been able to get around to dreaming up ideas. So I went in on the Thursday morning anyway and I said, um, oh, I'm sorry about this Mr. Davis, but uh, I've had a few problems and I haven't actually got a couple of ideas for you, but if we could just spend 10 minutes you know, knocking things about. I just need a germ of a thought and I'll take it from there. And he looked up from his newspaper with a cold stare. I think he'd never looked up at me before, <laughs> just recognised the voice. He looked up at me with a cold stare. He said, you're supposed to be an author, aren't you? And I said, well, yes. He said, well, fuck off and all. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, and it was the best bit of advice I ever had. I don't ever hold it against the chap. I, I went off and forced, uh for another couple of years for him, I think it was. But I was doing a, a, every day. I was doing a different story for different departments: western, school story, comedy story, whatever they wanted. And uh, so that was my introduction. And then one day. Uh, I had a phone, a call from one of the editors, and he said, there's a man at the Daily Mirror, his name's Julian Phipps, and he's got a problem. Now, there was a strip running called Belinda, and this was a pinch from the American Orphan Annie situation. Que tus and trailers. Visita the mi chap canal. who was writing Belinda, Don Freeman his name was, he'd gone sick, and he was so sick that he couldn't tell anybody what he was going to do with the rest of the story. And Phipps wanted somebody to script 
in a circle to bring it back to the point where hoping he got better and he could take over again. Yeah. And this uh, editor said, uh, well, get on to Peter O'Donnell, he'll give you a good job. So I went in and was briefed and I took this on and did it satisfactorily. Except I was a bit shocked because Fripp said, well, no, I want you to just draw the strips roughly. What? I can't draw. I can't draw. He said, it doesn't matter if it's stick men. He said, Lowry does stick men too. <laughs> <laughs> um, <well>. yes. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I did and he, he was very pleased with the result and the next thing I knew was I was called in by the uh, um, director in charge and, and asked if I would take over Garth because he felt it was dying on its feet. I took over Garth and uh, I ran that and Garth for about 15 years until the Modesty Blaze came up and I got too, too involved with novels and various other things. But that's how I came into Strip. And, and who, um, which commissioning editor asked you to come up with a Modesty, did the editor say, can you come up with a female oh, uh, no, comic no. strip? Or, or how did that happen? Well, uh, the strip editor at the, Daily, at the Express Group mm -hmm. was a man called Bill Aitken. And I had a call from him one day, I'd never m met him before, I knew him at all. I had a call from him and he said, I've seen your work on Garth and Tug Transom and Romeo Brown, because I was doing those by then. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'd like you to do a strip for me that I can submit to the Express. And I said, what sort of strip do you want? And he said, I want the strip that you want to write. Now, at this time I'd been doing big heroes, Garth, Tug Cranston and so on, and I'd also been writing text stories for women's magazines. And it occurred to it had occurred to me that it was about time that somebody woke up and produced a female who would be able to do all the hero stuff as well as or perhaps better than most men, but was still very feminine. And uh, so I thought now, I, I would probably never have done anything about this if it hadn't been write the script you want to write. So I said, well, it would be six months before I can give you eight weeks script of it because I've got a lot of work on that. That's fine, he said. Well, I then devised Modesty Blaze, which is another story that yeah. you're working out of that. And it started in May 1963. And, it was, uh, and this is before any mention of women's lib or... Oh yes, it was well ahead. Uh, it was well ahead. There 20 was the, years ahead. Almost, almost contemporary with this, um, they brought a woman into the Avengers, uh, on a black man. On a black man, mm. who was great in the Avengers. She was, yeah. yes, yes, and, and the, whole, the whole thing was good. It, it, towards the end it got a bit, bit out of hand, I yes, thought. Yes. Um, but uh, it was fine. So there was, the other people were beginning to think that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it so it worked out. But this was a long way ahead of the real yes. yeah. women's loop game. And the character Modesty Blaze, where did that first surface in your mind at the... Well, <laughs> that's, that's uh, quite a story. Um, I knew the kind of woman that she had to be, mm -hmm. but I, was, I couldn't see that you could take a, a girl from a shop or an office or school or nunnery or from whatever and teach her to be what I wanted this girl to be. She had to have had a really harsh upbringing and to have developed herself as a, a real survivor from childhood. Now, as soon as I sort of worked that out, and I think rather slowly most of the time, I was lucky because Twenty years before, in 1942, I was in charge. I was a sergeant in charge of a mobile radio detachment up in the north of Persia, just south of the Caucasus, where there was danger of German uh, breaking through and getting to the oil fields in the Middle East. The Iraq, sort of on that Iraq Iran right, border, 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 that border there. Yeah. Yes, so it was very dodgy. Now I wasn't put there to stop them <laughs> with my me and my three men, because there were three of us were radio operators and the other was a, dr a driver mechanic. We had a big uh, mobile radio truck. Uh, but we were there because we were getting reports 
but it's all in cipher which we didn't understand um, from observers in the Caucasus who I'm presuming this who were going to give warning and then the, the, the skeleton army in that area Pi Force as it was called would be built up well we were we, we, our truck was in the it was a rocky sort of desert and it was parked by a little rivulet a stream which fed a, an, another one but it was quite so several miles from anywhere and the set was under a camouflage netting and rations were brought up to us once a week and our rations consisted of tin, tin food and McConaughey's stew it was very good actually and uh, we were having our what we call dinner but what people call lunch these days of course yeah. And so we were sitting there eating our stew and drinking our tea when suddenly a child appeared around the corner of a low bluff coming, walking beside the river. And she was barefoot, she was wearing a, a shirt which came down to just above her knees. It, it was very, it had been washed a good few times and it, on her head she got a, a bundle in a half a blanket tied up. And she was about, we guessed, about 11 or 12. And she didn't, she was dark, but she, got, she, she didn't look like an Arab child for some reason. And at this time, 42, a lot of refugees were coming down from the Balkans who made their way all the way down. And of course, there was the Russian army, the Russian army was retreating and the Germans were pushing on. And, there was a trickle of these people coming through and you every now and again you'd see them sometimes in families sometimes alone this child was alone anyway she stopped when she saw us and we called out hello and all that and your, your soldiers always pick up a few words of the local language yes. you know in, in arabic i was yes stana was wait bardin was later uh, that sort of thing and she stopped and seemed to be considering going back but there was a bit of shade thrown by this bluff so she sat down in this shade and I, my detachment consisted of a jock, a Geordie and a Cockney and me and I, I said to Jock, look, put a, put a, give her a tin of mess tin of McConaughey's and a cup of char, a mug of char so he did this, it was all ready, and he started to move towards her and she jumped to her feet with her bundle and was made to run off and we all called out, you know, stand up, stand up, wait for me. And Jock moved back and put these on a that sort of rock there and then moved back to where we were. And we sort of tried to encourage her and she slowly came nearer and she got something hanging on a cord round her neck. We couldn't make out what it was. At any rate, she she signed and was, you know, is this for me? And we said, yes, yes. And she took it, went back to her place and began, well, there was Jock had put a spoon in it. And he, she began to eat. And we, I thought she'd wolf it down, but she was very slow and was savouring every mouthful. Oh, I forgot to say, she out of her bundle of, like, she pulled something that was wrapped up in, like, cheesecloth or something, began to eat it. It looked pretty horrible anyway. So she put this aside and she finished it and she drank her tea and we didn't interfere with her in any way and then surprisingly she went into this little rivulet and she, she washed her feet and then she washed up the, the, the mess tin and the mug with wet sand you can get grease out with yeah. wet sand very easily <coughs> and she brought them back and put them on the rock and to the little bow and put her hands together and obviously thanked us went back to sit down and have a rest and I got a couple of tins from our ration and we all of us, each one of us on my detachment had a tin opener which is vital possession in those days and uh, I got a couple of empty tins that we just used after a time she got up to go and I sort of waved to her to stop and went to this rock and indicated, you know, watch me. And 
use the empty tins to open the base. You, it was the old lever type tin, yes. of course. Yeah. <coughs> Open one of them, and she watched, and then I put the tin opener down, put the other empty tin to come in, and I, I retired, much to the mockery of my insubordinate detachment, I might say. They were highly amused by all this carry-on. And uh, she came along and picked up the tin opener, and she couldn't quite get it in, and so she picked up a rock or stone bandage. Anyway, she worked it round and she opened this tin. And then she held them up like that, and she smiled. Yeah. And Michael, you could have lit up a small village with that smile. Yeah. It was fabulous. And we all laughed and cheered. <laughs> no. And uh, then she, we indicated that she was to take the full tins. And once that got through, she undid her bundle and put them in with the tin opener. Kitus trailers, and, uh, visita mi canal. But what we had seen when she was close enough to that rock was that this cord round her neck was attached to a piece of wood to which a long nail had been bound with thin wire and it was an improvised weapon mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, you know, oh my God, what, what has made her yeah. find the need for this? Anyway, she picked up a bundle and said her goodbyes, put, put it on her head, and we all called out in our various accents and wished her well. And she walked off beside the river, and after about a hundred years, watched her go all the way. Brave, skinny little legs sticking out from this shirt, and she went out of sight around the bluff. Now, I don't know what her history was. Talking about her, we felt that she was a probably a Balkan child who got detached from her family and had been looking after herself. But she was very good at looking after herself. I mean, God knows where she was going or where she'd come from. And when I was looking for the ori origin of Modesty Blaze, I just thought instantly of this child because there it was. And I built up a story from there how she goes into a displaced person's camp. She meets an old refugee who happens to be a Jewish professor from Bucharest who speaks five languages and so forth and when something happens she fights for him and they go off together and they wander the Middle East throughout her growing up years mm -hmm. and she is the provider and protector and he teaches her mm -hmm. and he names her modesty because she's immodest <laughs> <laughs> and she chooses Blaze for herself because he, he tells her the story of Merlin and King Arthur and Blaze, who was the master of Merlin, taught him his magic. And she thought that was a nice name. And I thought it was a nice name to go with modesty. It, it, it's a it's nice a beautiful name. name yeah. And that's where she came from. Gosh, that's a fascinating story. I, I still feel quite emotional about it sometimes. Right, yes. Well, it's making me feel emotional about it. Because well, it's I think harsh. I, it's a I, harsh I, I hope and pray that whatever happened, she had a good life because she deserved it. Yeah. And, and there's no harsher way to start than that. No, no, indeed. Well, let's hope that wherever she was going, she got there. Yes, I hope so. I, I salute her. Yes. The, the final story. Cobra Trap that you wrote. Was that a story that you'd had, that you always knew that you were going to write that story with, with a, that kind of ending, or, or did that come to you one day? Yeah, I certainly didn't always know that. Mm -hmm. I suppose that when, when, in the early 90s, when I would have been 70 odd, mm -hmm. I realised the day would come when I would stop, or be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and. I used to think of, I mean, I live with these characters very much, and yeah. uh, they, they, they're alive for me, yes. and I'm fond of them. And I would, used sometimes to wonder what would happen to them. As, uh, obviously, I didn't want them, and I didn't think they would want to end up in a visita mi canal. home with a Zimmer frame and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I felt that they would really like to go out with a bit of panache, doing something useful. <coughs> and as the time went by, I mean, like, two or three years I suppose went by, uh, I'd give thought to this and a little idea would occur and I'd think yes that's that's not bad and I'd tuck it away and gradually the whole story developed and there came a time, I, sh I suppose it was about 94, 
uh, that I thought, oh, I must write this. I didn't, I wasn't thinking of publishing it at the time, but I wrote the story, and I, I set it 25 years in the future so that you got Modesty and Willie at mature ages, and and your other characters in it also had developed the running characters that yeah. I've got in the in the saga, and I wrote it, and. I had, at first I had some idea that I might have it published, let it be published posthumously. And then I thought, oh, don't be so bloody pompous, you know. <laughs> and really, <laughs> um, you know, if you're going to publish it, do it now. So that meant I got to write another four or five novellas to go with it. Yeah. So I spoke to Ernest Hecht about it. He said, yes, love to, love to have it, love to have it. So in the, during the next year, I wrote these other four novellas, I think, mm -hmm. in the Wake Up the Five. And what I did was to spread those from the time that Willie Garvin first joined the network through each story moved on to the, towards the development of their relationship and the, and the other characters who entered into the story to the end. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that was Cobra Trap. The last story was called, the last novella was called Cobra Trap. Mm -hmm. That's how it came about. Yes. It made me cry reading it. It's a wonderful story. Um, uh, quite a number of male tears have been shed on that, strangely. Uh, yes. it, it, it hit uh, quite a lot of people. I know two or three women who can't bring themselves to read it. Really? Yes. You know, they're not, they're not you know, silly women or anything yeah. of that sort. <laughs> sophisticated women. I'm sorry, I can't read it. And one, um, Jane Burke, my friend, she's an American writer and a very highly, she's very good and highly successful. Um, she, she said, I'll read it when you're gone, please. Yeah. <laughs> so she won't read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not for another 83 years. <laughs> um, Willie Garvin, um, was he a character that came to you fully formed or, or did you have to develop that over weeks and months? It, it, took, it took the weeks and months to develop Modesty Blaze mm -hmm. because gradually the, the, the adventures of this child developed and I was doing other work all the time yes. so it was on it's the back burner. But will you go, once I got Modesty Blaze settled and she was clear as a bell in my mind, I, I had known all along because I was doing a strip and you, I had to have a foil for Modesty Blaze. You can't have her having adventures mm. which consist of think balloons coming out of her head. You've got to have a buddy for her to talk with and discuss. Mm. Now, beyond that fact, I hadn't given any conscious thought to it, but I think that a lot must have been going on in the subconscious because I sat down one day and thought, now I must think about this. And I think that within 10 minutes, Willie Garvin had appeared entire and whole and perfect mm -hmm. um, with his name I and mean, sometimes I spend ages over names but not with this one his name was I mean Willie's a bit of a soppy name isn't it for, the, for that kind of character but it doesn't seem soppy for him no it doesn't at all it suits its own <laughs> yes it perfectly <laughs> works and and that had to be his name and he was he was exactly as you see him and, and, and read him so he did come fully formed into your conscious, yeah, yeah. conscious mind, yes. Yeah. And Sir Gerald Tarrant, was that a similar? Did he, this, did he come fully formed to you? Well, yes, he, he was going to be the head of, a, of an intelligence agency, uh, so he was going to be of a certain type. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have anybody particular in mind, but uh, if you ask me now, I suppose Harold Macmillan could have played him very well at the time that I'm thinking of. <laughs> He had an Edwardian touch to him, didn't yes. he? Yes. And, and Trans uh, Tarrant has an Edwardian touch. Yes. You, you've often used real-life experiences um, for much of, of the Modesty Blaze, many of the Modesty Blaze stories. Those real-life experiences. Um, you once told me a story that I was reading Willie the Gin uh, last week, and I recognised one of your stories that, that was in Willie the Gin, a real life story mm -hmm. in the aeroplane. Could you could you tell us about that? 
Yeah, you can hear the tune in the aeroplane. That's uh, when the aeroplane, it, it gets oh, blown up. it's going to crash or something. Yes. yes. Oh, well, this wasn't from my experience. It was the spirit experience of a mate of mine who was um, a rear gunner during the war. And they were, when I say they were shot down, they, yes, they were shot down, but they crash landed and it was in the forest of some sort. And you were watching this? No, I didn't see it. Oh, you didn't see it? I didn't see this one. But, um, but this is what he recounted to oh, me, oh, so it was really somebody else's experience. And as they hit the, the, the forest, his, the whole tail came off, including him, and he was cocooned in this thing and fell down through branches and hit the ground. And he was, he was shaken up. Uh, but it was basically unhurt, Good Lord. And, but the rest of the crew were badly damaged because they went ploughing through trees and it, it didn't, didn't blow up or burn, but uh, as I understand it, I think they were pretty badly hurt. He spent the rest of the war as a POW, but uh, it didn't have to be my experience. I'm quite happy to pinch other people's experiences. <laughs> And then you, you transferred that. It's a wonderful moment where in the strip story, where Modesty and Willie, they hold each other sort of in a oh, fetal position. They get to the back of the, back of the plane yes, at the safest as place. Yes, as it's right. diving, this death yes. dive, and they're actually holding each other embraced yes. against this, uh, waiting to land and crash. Yes. And um, it's a very warm, tender moment. You've got this aeroplane diving, you know, in a death dive. Yes. And it, yet you manage to get really warm tender yes these things just sort of happen and yeah. emerge from from what they are and what they are to each trailers other. Mm -hmm. visita mi canal. Um, strangely i was uh, i was reminded of something in the news which was the earthquake in turkey mm. of another occasion um and this was a personal experience uh, constant my wife and i were uh, in Mexico, and we were we were touring, but flying from place to place because it's a big country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were in a place called Oaxaca, which is small and and has a, a very small or had at the time. This I'm going back 20 years now. A very small airfield, and we were heading for Acapulco, and we we took off and we got to Acapulco early evening, and went to our room in the hotel. It was a package tour, so there was a party of us. And our room was on the eighth floor. And I, we had a sh I had a shower, and I was lying on one of the two beds, looking at a guidebook, and Constance was in the shower. And suddenly the s sound of like water hammer in the pipes, if you've ever heard that, but you can get a s curious effect of, I don't know whether it's air in the pipes, but sort of bang, 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 bang. And I thought, oh, shit. And it got louder and louder, and then suddenly the bed started to wobble about and started walking. And at the same moment, the door of the bath, the shower of the bathroom was open, and I had a crash, and a lot of tiles fell off the wall. And Constance appeared in the doorway, clad in a shower cap, and said, I think it's an earthquake. And I thought, <laughs> Good, good thinking. <laughs> and so I sprang up and, and got her and we stood under the lintel of the door. Yes. I mean, God knows what it was going to do at, at eight floors up. Yes. But I mean, even if it's a, a, a straw that you clutch at, yeah, it's you, better than having yeah. a ceiling fall on you. You've got to do something. And this this went on, this shaking and and the tr there's tremendous noise. You, you think, where's it coming from? It's like a dozen express trains. And this is the, I've told, the, the plates of rock grinding against each other and uh, below the surface. Terrible noise. And uh, this went on for anything between 60 minutes and three months, as far as we were concerned. <laughs> and then it stopped. And from the corridor, we were near the lift. We heard cries for help. And these were the unfortunate people who'd been in a lift at the time. And uh, cut a long story short, nobody had been hurt. There was a bit of damage to the hotel. I mean, when we went, we, we went out, we got our clothes on, our passports, our money, and went out to go downstairs. 
and uh, first things first, get a bottle of wine and then think about it, yeah. which we did, and others were gathered there. And uh, there was one one section moved that we sleep on the beach that night because it would be safer. And I said, well, I'm not sleeping on the beach because you can get a tidal wave and you're all gone then. Yeah, which earthquake, of course. You could have been washed right back up to the hotel. <laughs> so we, we expected further tremors, but they're usually minor tremors. And we all went back to bed that, that night. Constance woke up about three or four times and said, there's a tremor, there's a tremor. I said, no, you're imagining things, you go to sleep. But the next morning, everybody was saying there were tremors. Yeah, tremors I'd been the one that was wrong. But I use that experience, the opening of um, the Xanadu Talisman. Xanadu Talisman, yeah. that's right. One of my remember favorite, it better than I do. Bob. One of my favorite openings. Yes, there's modesty. She's encaved in what was a underground car park, but in just a part of it, in, in an inspection pit, in fact. I think. Yes, and yes, that's, yeah. But there's also an unconscious Arab there mm -hmm. and another Arab who is intent on trying to kill the unconscious one. With a stiletto knife. With yeah. a stiletto knife. Yeah. And uh, Modesty Blaze is trying to, to prevent him doing so. I mean, she's come fallen through the floor of her bedroom into yeah. this place. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, with a bed, so there was the mattress that she landed on. And fortunately, there's light from one of the cars which had its lamps on. But uh, it puts her in a, a nice little pickle to start a story with. When did you first hear about Quentin Tarantino and his admiration for Modesty Blaze? Oh, well, that was uh, before he became a, a, a household name throughout the world uh, with Pulp Fiction. I had a call one day from a girl who said she was calling from America and uh, on behalf of Mr. Quentin Tarantino who was making a film with John Travolta in it and he wished to have John Travolta carrying a first edition copy of Modesty Blaze virtually throughout his appearance in the film and uh, did I have any objection to this and I said well I was taken aback rather I said well are you in any way denigrating the character oh no no she said Mr Tarantino is a great fan of Modesty Blaze so I said, well, fine, and thank you very much for the courtesy of asking, which I did think was a courtesy because I didn't need to ask him yeah. whether we would carry this book. Yeah. Um, but it was, an, it was a nice thought, and I appreciated it. I've got a soft spot for Quentin since oh, then. good. Most, of course, wouldn't have asked, I suspect. I don't think so. I yeah. certainly was surprised. So getting to the film that we've, yeah. that we've made, um, what, what do you think of the film that, that you've seen now and that we made? I was very pleasantly surprised by it. Um, it's the opening part, of course, is based on a personal experience of mine. Yes. Uh, as you know. And then it's, it's taken up and it's pursued through the growing up of modesty and under the education of this uh, polymath man that she's she saved mm -hmm. for years and ends up with the way in which she happens to take over a gang in Tangier because she, she's employed there and when there's an attempt to take over by a rival gang she is the one who sorts it all out and it's very well done indeed. Oh thank you. And uh, it, the way it's planned also reveals this story of Modesty Blaze and what she's about, which is good. Mm. Mm. The, um, the what we, what we have canal. never touched on, and we, we may never touch on, is the, the, the way that Modesty, she had this harsh, I mean, an incredibly harsh, you know, she, through adolescence, through this traveling, she was, mm. you know, raped by, uh, at least once. Yes. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the people who read the comic book think that they would never relate that this, that the that kind of no. that she'd had that harsh upbringing. No. And um, we were talking yesterday evening about that we've never actually in any of the scripts we would well, obviously not be overt visually with that, but we've never actually 
got through in any of this script just how tough it was for her. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, as part of her backstory, the fact that it, it, it was harsh beyond belief, um, that we've never really explained that to an no, audience, no, that no. she's carried that baggage with her up, up, up until she met yeah. Danny Shabazz, yes. who was, you know, helped yes, in the healing, yes, indeed. the healing of all of that. Now, um, in the Xanadu Talisman, which you mentioned, you get a very good example of that, very that good. when she has the bad dream. Yes. And, and stumbles and, and yes. you know you're, she's sort of breaking down and, and you don't know why yes. and, and that she tells Willie that story yes, when the dream comes. But, which I was particularly interested in exploring that side yes. to give the audience an understanding just how harsh that yes, upbringing that's, that's interesting you know it, it, uh, just I think emotionally to begin to understand modesty more mm. but I, I, I think that's a pretty key yes you see You've got to find room for all these things. Got to find room for them <laughs> in the action and in the entertainment yes. and, and, and in the get me out of here, yes. which the Xanadu Talisman has plenty of. My favourite, probably, is oh, when Willie. Yeah, it's when, really good. with oh, that's yeah. when you're writing um, that sort of situation, you, you get you get it and you start writing that. Is it pre-planned? In other words, do you? So you have it all plotted and mapped out, or do you write yourself <coughs> into trouble, excuse me, write yourself into trouble almost not knowing how you'll get out of the... So Willie's got the concrete no, change in his legs. I think I, I think I know how the get out is going to work before I get them into it. Yes. Because that governs how you get them into it. Um, I think I do. Tell you the truth, Michael. This sort of question is difficult for me because I hate to try to analyse what I do. Yes. I'm very much a gut writer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, c I could never plot a whole book through. I can plot a sort of situation that will develop, and I, and I get to that point. I think I can't get any further. I write the first chapter. Then it begins to come alive, and by the time I've written that first chapter, I know that it's going to move on all right. And, but I don't like to analyse too much because if you if you say, oh, well, this is how I do it, you're getting into a formula. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah. that's what I, I, I greatly fear. So. And it's obvious from the comics and the novels, it, it's, um, there are so many different facets of it that it's, it, the yeah. formulas are not no, no, stuck to it anyway. At all. No. The recurring characters and the whole world you've built Yes. around Modesty yes. and Willie yes. you know, and their friends and, and the people they interact with. I mean, yes. There's a huge um, cast of people around them, from novel to novel, the recurring characters. Yes, they're, they're, and they're very important and I love my recurring mm. characters. I mean, and, I, I, and the fans do too. Yes, yeah. uh, you know, if, if I've got Charles Pennefeather in, I love writing his dialogue because he's so lovable. But yes. And, and so, such a good man, really. Yeah, very good man. Yeah. And you would, but not at least the, the, the kind of guy that you think that Odyssey would take for a boyfriend or lover or one no. of them. Which is often the case with, with her boyfriends, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Um, I mean, she takes Quinn out of compassion, doesn't she? Yes, you? yes. Yeah. Stephen Collier is, is an unlikely yes. boyfriend for such a beautiful woman. Yes, and, and the artist in um, Dragon's Claw. Yes. But... Uh, Gosh, I'm just re I'm de bring remembering more. The, um, the the sculptor in Norway yes. who can't get on with it until she takes him to bed. Yes. Oh, she's she's good therapy, Mark. Oh. So Modesty Blaze has acquired a tag, which is an easy comparison being compared to James Bond. Can you tell us, you know, why she actually there are some very big differences between Modesty and James Bond. Well, it, it, it is a, a bit of shorthand, really, but it saddens me rather because they are not like each other at all. Um, and James Bond, to my mind, in that genre of fiction, is is probably the outstanding character of the 20th century. Yes, I difficult. Agree. I mean, the saint, perhaps, but. Yes. Uh, certainly, James Bond is right at the top there. The same, the TV version, the, the film was right. Uh, the, the books were very good. Yes. The books were very good. Yes. Uh, in their time. Yes. Um, Sorry, back to James Bond and modesty. Yes, back to James Bond and modesty. Well, 
thing about James Bond, of course, again, you've got to distinguish between the James Bond books and the James Bond films. Yes. Because the books don't have a bevy of girls in it. The books don't have those wonderful, crazy stunts in it that, that, that make so much of the, of the film. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're easy to think of. The, the car that's got to go through a narrow alleyway and suddenly turns yeah. half on its side and goes through. Or that wonderful opening to, I think it's for your eyes only, when he's skiing down a great slope being shot at by pursuing skiers mm -hmm. and he hurtles over the edge of a vast drop and I don't know who did it but it's a marvellous bit of stunt yeah. work because yeah. the camera is on that skier the whole time she falls you see him dropping down and one ski is thrown aside and the other three is thrown, mm -hmm. thrown aside and he's got a pack on his back and suddenly the pilot chute comes out of the pack and then a parachute mm -hmm. comes out and there's a Union yeah, Jack yeah, on there. It's classic, isn't it? I thought it's not yeah, music. Yeah. But then you don't get those in the books, so you really I'm them. really talking about the films now. Yes, yes. And where whether it's uh, Sean Connery or Roger or whatever, there's the bevy of girls, um, there's the cr lovely crazy stunts, but he doesn't have a life outside his particular mission. His mission starts and finishes mm -hmm. with you know a bit of fun with a girl and uh, probably end looking on in some strange way but that's the end of it now with modesty blaze she he hasn't i mean bond doesn't have a home or friends mm -hmm. or interests and modesty blaze has all these things she has a circle of friends she has a home uh, in london she has a cottage in wiltshire mm -hmm. and she has interests many interests other than just whatever happens to be to come her way in the way of action uh, in the village she goes to the village fairs uh, she runs a donkey sanctuary in her near her home in, in Tangier uh, she has some what three perhaps four more or less regular lovers or yeah. boyfriends call them what you will bed fellows mm -hmm. but they all understand the situation mm -hmm. she's not she's not uh, shortchanging anybody mm -hmm. And uh, she's very good with lame, do lame dogs too. Very good. Yes. Very good therapy for them, Michael. And she's very compassionate. Uh, and she has all these. She's cr well. So she's creative. I suppose I've created a whole world about her with yes. with running characters that mm -hmm. that pop in and out of books and strips. And that inform us about modesty. Oh yes. Really yes, they do indeed. Kind. Because that's where you you get their opinion of her mm -hmm. and so forth so that's the big difference i think um the comic strip yeah know, it's it's been re-syndicated um, mm -hmm. not because there's a film because no but the film isn't out yet um the, the novels has, have been in 16 languages they continue to be re-licensed around the world india sri lanka four corners of the yes, earth really and, mm -hmm. and and now we're seeing that Although you've stopped writing the comic strip, we're seeing the fact that actually that we're going to see it all again. I think. Well, yes. Why, why do you think that we, you've managed to cross this generational divides, you know, over 40 years, and I, still as strong as ever? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, certainly, it doesn't seem to date. Yes. Well, I, I say that occasionally. I think would date because one of the old early stories was based around the Vietnam War and set there. Yes. Well, you wouldn't run that again today. Though, I suppose you might, why not? Well, it has historical it has perspective. It historical thing. Um, but that's, that's the way it goes. Um, I think it must be because people like the character. Yes. It's not, it's not her martial arts that attract. I mean, you can get martial arts twice a week yeah. on, on, on those, uh, television games. Yeah. Yeah. And, and great that stuff. Means, yes. Um, it's, it's, I get a, there's a lot of uh, fan chat, or they've set, I, I haven't set up a, a, a site, right. but the fans have set up, there are several sites, yes. I believe, and they, they talk among themselves, and they, they say, oh, which was your favourite funny bit from things, or well, which was this, that, and the other. And what strikes me is that, what they, they never talk about Modesty Blow's martial arts skills. No. Never. They talk about how she handled this and that or the other. And I think that it is her attitude to life and the way she responds to various things within action and outside action domestically mm. that, that appeals to them. Mm. 
um, I can't take much credit for it because she came into my mind as I present her. I didn't sort of think, no, I must, make, I must have a girl who does this and yes. you know, put all the yeah. ingredients in and mix the pot. That's how she emerged. Yeah, she me. just emerged and, yeah. and developed that way yeah, and this is the whole emotion. I think it's the emotional side of that she cares about her friends, she'll go to exactly. you know, ex-network operatives if they're in trouble, it doesn't matter where they are, no. any part of the world. No. She's the truest of friends. She's absolutely, completely, there's a real truth and um, yes. bedrock in it. She'll do anything for a friend. Then. Yes, indeed. And I think that people like this. Yes. Uh, some of the, oddly enough, some of the one or two of the fans have sort of agreed with each other. They say, if I come, you know, if I, you know, come across a problem, I sometimes think, what would Modesty Blaze yes. do? Now they're not talking about action stuff at all. They're yeah. talking about some domestic, simple problem. But they're aware that she must face the same, mm -hmm. you know personality problems with people or whatever it may be and, and, and that's really embraced in her the, the morality that you've yes given to modesty yes, her is. morality mm -hmm. even though she's a, a, a retired criminal yes you know in, in the network days there was never any drugs there was never any oh, no. vice no, no. and so the, uh, uh, nobody ever got killed that wasn't about to kill exactly she never her. harmed anybody who wasn't trying to harm either her or her friends, or the country that she has chosen to live in. Yes, and, and so that I think that, that is a hugely in, uh, enduring quality that you get that morally, what, that moral what, base. What keeps it? This is why they're prepared to rerun the whole series mm -hmm. for, for 38 years. Yes. <laughs> yeah, of, of material there for the for weekly strips, but of course the albums soak them up quicker. But uh, yeah. There you go. And all this, that, mor that sort of, the morality that you've built around her, it's all sort of at a time in a world where a lot of morality is yes. falling by the wayside. Yes, so it is. there's a nostalgic um, yes, I think, yes, I think magnetism right towards that yes, morality. Yes, that hasn't occurred to me, but I'm sure that is, a, is an important quality in it. If you had to choose one of your novels to base the next film on, which will have you know, at the moment only modesty is in the first film. Yes. And the next film, we're going to have Willie Garvin and the full team. Wh which novel would you naturally gravitate towards? Well, um, I have gravitated always towards the idea of a, of a taste for death. Mm -hmm. But um, the recent experience of experimenting with this have given me the impression that it's a book that can't properly be encompassed within a two hour feature film. So if I could leave that aside yeah. and look elsewhere, um, if I had to choose a book, a novel for the next film or the one after that, if, if you do succeed in making um, A Taste for Death, I would go for The Silver Mistress. And I have two reasons for that, um, perhaps three. One is that in it, the greatest ever one-to-one -one battle that Modesty Blaze ever fights is included, where she is in the crystal cave, with, she's rescuing Tarrant who is crippled, mm -hmm. uh, she's facing the greatest combat man in the world who has already proved his superiority to her, and she's got to beat him. And to do this, she's, she uses what she so often uses, which is whatever comes to hand, the externals. And because she has brought Tarrant out through a very difficult cave where they've had to squeeze through bedding planes and so forth, they brought with her a can of grease, which she greased. Yes. And she says to him, they waited, they know that Sexton, this master uh, combat man, is coming. Tears off all her clothes and she says to Tarrant, grease me all over. There's a, there's a, there's a, a river running through this yes. thing. And he does this. And one of the reviewers, when it was published last year, said that she's found this the, the, the most sexy scene she'd ever come across in popular fiction. Yes. And it is really. Mm. And there's nothing, it's not really titillating because 
He is so sad, he thinks he's greasing her. He thinks he's like a, a priest oiling her to be killed, you yes. know, but yes. from ancient times. And there's and no, the whole situation's hopeless. Yeah. Absolutely. And then she puts him in this little boat and pushes him across the river and says, go, 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 you know, you, you can find your way up from now on. And she turns to face sex and he doesn't go, of course. Yes. Um, and she fights, but because she is greased, he can't get a grip on her. Yes. And, I mean, I won't give the way she finally yes. finishes up, yeah. but it is a great, great scene. Mm. And the aftermath is. is great. Yes. Now, on top of that, this novel contains my favourite villains, which, the, the right names are Colonel Jim Strake and Lucy Strake, but they call, they're American, and they're not being nasty to Americans now because all the other villains are Brits, yes. but they call each other Mama and Papa. They are totally evil. Mm. But you have this extraordinary <laughs> situation where they talk to each other, Mama, what are you going to do, Mama? Oh, Papa, oh, Papa, this sort of thing. And they're completely demonic, yeah. And they're demonic, <laughs> yes. And they're hilarious and demonic, which mm. I think is, is, is terrific. Yes. Well, thank you very much for talking to us, Peter, and uh, thank you very much for giving us 38 years of Modesty Blaze. I've well, enjoyed it very much. Thank you, and I, I hope all the fans continue to enjoy Modesty and her exploits. I'm sure they will. Thank you very much.